Hello there, my name is Brent, and right now we are in the abandoned mining town of Cerro Gordo. And back in the 1860s, this town was the largest producer of silver for the state of California. And for the past two years, this place has been my home. And I am just in love with everything abandoned and all of the history here. So in this video, we are gonna take a trip. We are gonna take a trip to what was dubbed the next Cerro Gordo. The town they were talking about is called Panamint City, and it was known as one of the roughest and toughest mines back in the day. And these days, the only way to get to Panamint City is a grueling hike. So I think it's time that I'm gonna pack up, hit the road, and we're gonna see everything about the next Cerro Gordo. All right, so I'm packing up, got my bag going here, and actually we are going to see two abandoned ghost towns in this video. Uh, the first stop is gonna be Ballarat, which is named after the Australian town, and it is the main kind of outpost that miners used in that part of Death Valley back in the 1890s. It is also later where Charles Manson hid out, the serial killer, which is a little bit more grim. So I'm gonna finish packing up over here, we're gonna hit the road, we're gonna go to Ballarat. I'm gonna explain more about the hike into Panamint City, and we're gonna see all sorts of history of Death Valley mining. So right now I'm driving down Cerro Gordo's yellow grade road, which is the same road that Lola Travis Ned, Reddy, and Remy Nadu, all the people that went from Cerro Gordo over to Ballarat would have taken. So these same cast of characters would just go from mining camp to mining camp. Because you gotta think, back in the day, people weren't thinking of mining camps as long-term operations. You know, they thought the ore strike would happen, it might last five or seven years at the most, and then they were on to the next, you know? And so the money was made of getting in, getting out. The money wasn't made of sticking around, and so, I'm sure the word hit Cerro Gordo of, hey, there's a huge strike. And at that point, you know, the fears are there that, hey, maybe Cerro Gordo is about to be tapped out. And so there was always this urgency to find the next thing before you got caught holding the bag. And so Lola and uh, Mr. Reddy and Remy Nadu all made their way over there, you know? And Remy Nadu is probably the most known of all the characters that made their way from Cerro Gordo to Panamint City. Remy owned a freighting service, so 20 mule teams. And so he eventually became known as the King of the Desert Freighters. But he, along with Belshaw, whose house I stay in, and some others formed the Cerro Gordo Freighting Company. And the Cerro Gordo Freighting Company was contracted to take ore from Panamint City, where we're headed, uh, into Los Angeles, and to bring supplies from Los Angeles to Panamint City. Part of what I get such excitement about is just uncovering those histories and trying to weave them together. So with that, we're gonna continue trekking before we get to Panama City. Tonight, my plan is to get to Ballarat and figure out a camp situation. We're chasing the sun. By then we're gonna get there. Now ghost town, Ballarat served nearby mining camps from 1879 to 1917. They produced nearly a million in gold, the jail, and a few adobe ruins remain. Seldom seen Slim, its last resident, was buried in Boot Hill in 1868. All right, and here we are. We are entering Ballarat, the once home to a lot of infamous outlaws back in the 1890s. Probably some of them hit out there. But it's beautiful, it's right in the Panamint Range. Here's some of the original adobe houses. There's the one General Post store. Wild burrows. Hello guys. <laughs> All right, we're out here in Boot Hill the cemetery in Ballarat. And this is the resting place of seldom seen Slim. He's a prospector that uh, has some connections to Cerro Gordo as well. This is the Panamint Range. 
Panamint City would be kind of up there. Back in the 1890s, Ballarat was the jumping off point to all the mines in the Panamint Range. And at its peak, it had multiple saloons, hotels, even a post office like Cerro Gordo. So I have to imagine many of the characters that walked the streets of Cerro Gordo also walked the streets of Ballarat. You know, they entered the same buildings. They saw the same shape of the mountains around them. And for me, it's interesting to put myself in those shoes and wonder what they dreamed of. You know, wonder who was the last person to drive that broken down truck. Did Remy Nadu ever go to the general store here? And then to try to imagine getting from Cerro Gordo to Ballarat without a truck, but by mule. You know, it all makes me appreciate everything about their lives that much more and just appreciate the history that's all through this valley. I am pulling over to the campsite now. I'm gonna set up and just camp out of my, uh, my truck tonight and then hit it in the morning. So, should be good, should be exciting. Looking forward to it. Right, <sighs> just getting up, getting it to the trailhead. Uh, I definitely have to work on my car camping. Uh, it was really windy, so I couldn't sleep in the bed. So I ended up sleeping in the cab. So I didn't sleep great, but it seems to have calmed down as far as the wind goes now. So I'm gonna gear up, and we're gonna go find this trailhead, and we're gonna go see Panama City. Looking like a beautiful morning. Bye bye, Ballarat. Now to go try to find this trailhead. I was told it was about two miles this way. Look for a white rock. It says Sunrise Canyon. To set the context a little bit more before we start this hike, I want to talk about Panamint City. It was known as the roughest and toughest mine in this part of the region. Three bandits were hiding out in this canyon after robbing a Wells Fargo coach for $12,000. They happened upon this massive ore deposit. Silver, silver ore, a whole ledge of it. It's a whole mountain of it. What are we gonna do with this now we got it? Our bars with a price on our heads. We can't go near a recorder's office to file. We can't even have the stuff assayed without running the risk of being arrested. They found this Nevada senator that apparently was a little bit corrupt, but also very involved in the mining industry. Silver, a showy man, $600 a ton. How did you get hold of these? And so some type of deal was brokered. The bandits apparently got off and that started Panamint City. And by 1874, this town was a full blown boom town. 2000 people living up there, 50 buildings along Main Street, and it was just the next spot. It was that next Cerro Gordo, you know? Lola Travis came up and bought a plot of land. Ned Reddy got his saloon going up there and everything. Then, in 1875, rumors started getting out that, hey, maybe this mine is gonna shut down. But the same year, others thought it was just getting going, so they constructed a 20-stamp mill there. That's a pretty serious operation, especially given the remote nature of this. The guys who built the stamp mill were concerned about bandits. So they came up with a pretty genius idea to make their ore into 200-pound balls. And I guess the bandits did come, and they saw these balls and they even had the audacity to go to the owners and complain <laughs> about how difficult it was to steal the ore out of Panamint City. And then by 1876, you know, the death blow was dealt. There was a flash flood that flooded all the way down the canyon. You know, even this stuff behind me was all washed out. Different mining companies started coming back and sporadically operating it, but never to the scale that it was. And the state used to maintain this road. I think until the 1980s, you know, and you can look back and you can see Jeeps crawling up the waterfalls that we're gonna have to go up in just a minute. But for the last, you know, couple decades, it's been unmaintained. So the only way to get there is a hike. There's gonna be about, I believe, three or 4,000 feet of elevation gain. And finally, we're gonna get into the town. All right, so this is the Chris Wick camp, and this is kind of the trailhead for the hike. And there used to be a big mining operation here, but unfortunately, a lot of it burned down in 2006. And so we are going to make our way to the trail and start climbing.
All right, so I already got to where the water starts. So apparently for about a quarter mile, you walk through water and there's a lot of waterfalls that you have to walk through and the water can even be, you know, up to here deep. So I'm gonna change out of my boots. So far reminding me a lot more of the beverage hike than any others because of the water you're wading through, the stamp mills, all that type of stuff. And so we'll see. I'm really interested to see how this compares to the beverage hike and the salt tram hike. I would say of the hikes I've done, those are the two hardest. So the town itself is way up the canyon, but Apparently when that flash flood happened, it washed all sorts of machinery and things like this and just things that they never came to recover. You know, this obviously would have been later than that 1876 flood, but I imagine there's tons of flash floods since. And sometimes it would just pick up vehicles, throw them down here and you know, that's where they remain. And one of the most common things that I say in the videos is walk the wash, you know, meaning walk down the area where the water washes through. And I say that because that's where a lot of the good stuff is. Walking the wash is probably how they discovered a lot of these mining camps to begin with. What a lot of the prospectors would do is they would come to these washes in different canyons and look in the ground for what's called float, you know, gold or silver that would be just sitting on the ground. So you would continue walking up the wash and as you continued finding pieces, you knew that that ore deposit, that surface deposit was still above you. Prospectors would take, you know, months just walking up these washes finding the ore and then when they stopped finding the ore up the wash then they would start triangulating and that from my understanding is how a lot of these mining camps were established so if you're ever out in nature by where mines used to be walk the wash Human stupidity has no limit. Beautiful little hike, huh? You can see this man-made hole here. And I was told back in the day, they used to have poles in this so that way Jeeps could winch themselves up these waterfalls and that way they could make it to the town with their cars. I've seen photos of it, it looks crazy, but I'm pretty sure that would have been from a pole that that way they would have secured and gone on with. But so far, this hike is absolutely stunning, you know, with the water coming down everywhere. Definitely bring a pair, change of shoes. But other than that, this is great. Another cool old truck in the wash. That thing's sweet. I wonder who drove that. I wonder when they drove it. Sun's starting to peek through and it's absolutely beautiful. We're at 4,300 feet in elevation and climbing 
Right now it's just pretty gradual, but just relentless, you know? It's just a pretty casual trail, just walking up a wall so you can see. You can tell how there used to be a road here. And the waterfall portion, it was difficult to imagine a road. But this, it's pretty wide. See the stuff all along the edge? This is a Fedra, where you can make a Fedrine out of, or Mormon tea. So you take some of this, you put it in a pot, you leave it out in the sun, and it makes a tea that's slightly uh, a stimulant. We're almost there. Following in the footsteps of Remy Nadu and Lola Travis and Mr. Reddy. I just got my first glimpse of the giant smokestack for the smelter. You can see way in the distance there, the beginning of the stack. Quite flat right here. And the wash has gotten huge. So it's like a, a plain or a meadow almost. And we have arrived at Panamint City Hilton, as it's called. Look at the scenery around here. It's just stunning. Pretty nice, you know? Well maintained. A lot more traffic than beverage and all that. Got a guidebook that we can look through. <laughs> That is awesome. That can't be real. When you walk in, you got the wood burning stove, two cots, great condition. If you were to go through here, there's a bed. Actually quite comfortable. So you have that. There's a bathroom over here that's kind of all out of order. Um, probably, I mean, definitely due to no running water and such, but can't be the view out of that bathroom that might rival our outhouse view at the top of Cerro Gordo. I don't know. This is, uh, it's known as the Hilton here, and I can see why. It's it's really well done. It's really well maintained. So this one of the Main Street back in the day, and they said that there was 50 businesses along here, along this rocky little road. And I think on the left side of the road is where Lola Travis, the brothel owner from Cerro Gordo, bought a plot. But imagine there's 50 buildings all along here, and then there's houses everywhere, made out of stone, made out of tents, made out of little shacks like you see up on the hillside there. It would seem like that flood was bound to happen, but I suppose at that period of time, they were more interested in the ore than the once in a decade flood. It's also crazy, just everything that came up here had to be brought on that trek that we just took. It just kind of shows the grit and the determination of these miners back in the day. So let's go over to see the smokestack. Here it is, kind of the landmark of Panamint City these days. And it is tall. <laughs> the scaffolding needed to put that thing up, what is that? At least 80, 100 feet. This must have taken us months to do. You know, you can tell that it's starting to crumble. Like most mining towns, Panamint City probably has some shelf life. Oh, wow. Look at that shovel. So I guess that would have been used to shove some things down in there. Oh, there's even a burnt timber still in there. If they were smelting lead and silver, they had to get it up about, oh, 1700 degrees Fahrenheit. So that needed to be hot back in the day. Over here, there must have been another structure formed. Just so cool. I mean, the bricks are here. If there was an ambitious team that wanted to rebuild some things, wouldn't be easy, but it would be doable. So the Panama City never quite became the next Cerro Gordo. You know, it had a much shorter life because of the flood and some other things. But you could see how they would wonder. You know, anytime somebody hit a big strike, is this gonna be the next one? And then all sorts of people flood into town from the prospectors to the con men to the brothel owners, to restaurants, saloons, and everything in between. And now it sits here, you know, another nearly forgotten town that at one point in time was a lot of people's whole lives. And here was, must have been their last go at it. You know, this is all modern machinery. And I wonder the guy who built this, got all this up here was like, you know what? 
I know that this mining camp has been tapped for years, but there's still more in these hills. I'm gonna give it another run. It's interesting looking around now. I wonder what happened to the guy that imagined up all this. You know, did he stay here until it was too late? Did he get out and try somewhere else? Did he ever turn a profit? It's something that I relate to, you know? I'm not mining again at Cerro Gordo, but I definitely feel there's more there that should come to life. These would have been to make sure that the rocks weren't too big. So they were sorting them here, dumping them out, probably backing up with a truck, doo -doo 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 -doo, dumping them into this hopper. So you can see the kind of the, to let the ore in. They would have gotten crushed by that crusher below us on the conveyor belt out down into that where they probably would have added a bunch of water it would have been shaken to be even refined even further and then further refined down in that insane you know some guy thought of this this is almost like a little motel this must have been for the more recent miners as well looks like they retrofitted an old structure to make it into housing for their guys. Some of this might have been workspace over here. You got a crusher there back in the day. Workbenches. Huh, imagine driving that sedan up here. I could see the trucks getting up here, but this, that's crazy. Getting that sun-baked brown is like my dream for all the cabins at Cerro Gordo. And just patch any of the knot holes with old tins. This looks like a DIY, I was gonna say ore bucket. They cut off the bottom of a barrel to pull ore out. You gotta be inventive when you're out here, you know? It's not like the guy living in that little shack is running to the Home Depot anytime. Another shack, just again, amazing construction, look, feel of this wood. It's beautiful. So we have the wood burning stove in here. Oh man, hardwood floor. This thing is sweet. Oh, what is that, an old milk craton? Dairy, yeah, milk cart. That's so cool. And look at this, this is what I believe they call the castle. Look, hot tub, heat it up over there, have a little bathtub, have that view. Ha! That's so smart and so cool. Beautiful spot. Wow, this one is fancy. This one is really set up. All sorts of info over here as well. Wow. History of Panamint City, Death Valley Scotty. Oh, they had their own newspaper from 1874. And they have prices. Flour, nine cents. Bacon, 28 cents a pound. Ham, 30 cents a pound. First death in Panamint. Knife wound, yikes. Oh, there we go. P. Reddy, attorney at law, Independence, California. That is the one-armed lawyer. So there's a bakery here, there's a post office here. Hard to believe now when there's like nothing there, but so this is a note from the guy that built the castle or rebuilt it. He says, for those that you would ask why, why did I work on this castle? Just read the log cover to cover and look at the photo of my son and I, then you'll understand. Enjoy, Rob Tyler. P.S. Miss you, son. Son Brett passed away because of a blood clot. It seemed like the two of them would come up here a lot and we worked on this for a very long time. That's super special. I'll leave the story of that here if you want to come up, but seems like a pretty important
important place to Mr. Tyler and uh, thanks Rob for keeping on and restoring places like this that's super special pretty good memory if you ask me I think these old places that have a lot of history to them should be as open as they can possibly be, you know. For Cerro Gordo, that means, you know, every day we're open for tours. But if Brett and his dad can rebuild that cabin way up here, then a uh, hotel doesn't seem like that much of a deal anymore. And I hope that when it's done, many of you can make memories up there just like people are making memories here. Well, 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 what do we have here? I don't mind if I do. <laughs> oh, somebody camped there. That seems uh, questionable given carbon dioxide, but hey, I guess they were close enough to the entrance where it didn't matter. Ah, back home in an abandoned mine. Here's their old dynamite vault. This is where they would have stored all the dynamite back in the day these days just an empty room well Panamint City thank you now I know what Lola Mr. Reddy and Mr. Nadu would have seen back in the day would have been a lot more bustling. I wonder what cities we think are bustling now will look like this in the future. Leave a comment below because that is an interesting question. You know, anytime I come to a place like this, I just feel a little bit more connected to both nature and history. Walking into Panama filled me with just a greater appreciation for everything I had read about the town. You know, I think that's the case with all of my adventures. It's one thing to read about how rough the terrain is that these miners took on to make a living, but it all just comes to life so much more when you walk those same footsteps. You know, even if most of the buildings have succumbed to time and weather, the scenery is still the same. The air is just as crisp as they would have breathed in. And you can kind of get that sense of what life might have been like back then. And to me, it just brings history alive. And that's what gets me so excited, whether it's at Cerro Gordo or Panama City or all through these hills, is just bringing this history to life. And I think there's an importance in experience all of that. You know, seeing the broken down cars and trying to imagine the last time they ran or the fallen down cabin and trying to think of the dreams of the guy that nailed that wood together. It's a reminder to me to make each day count, you know, to try, period, on whatever you might be trying for. You know, because eventually our car will be the broken one down in the wash. You know, and our cabin will be sun-baked and abandoned. And that cabin doesn't turn that way overnight. You know, it happens day by day, just like our life. And so I think it's important to get out there, experience these things, both for a greater appreciation of the past, but also a greater appreciation for the present. Let's do a quick step count check oh about 40,000 steps today that's going to update more so i started at about 2600 feet that's a lot of steps in one day all right so that's it guys that was panamint city we now know what lola travis and all of the others would have walked into 150 years ago i just want to say thank you guys as always, thank you all so, so, so much for following along on these adventures. It really just means the world for me. You know, as I get to explore and piece together more of the Cerro Gordo history, being able to share it just makes it that much more interesting. And now I want to give you a sneak peek at an upcoming video, a video that I am extremely excited about, something very near and dear to my heart that I've been working on over the last few weeks that will still take me a little bit longer to finish, but that is a library. 
a library that in my mind is going to be the coolest library in the world. It's going to be a library where no other library has ever been before. And the reason I'm bringing it up now is because I have an offer for you guys. I want to do a trade. If you have a book that's related to mining, related to history, related to California history, related to the gold rush, related to anything that you could see somehow being related to Cerro Gordo, I would love to trade you something special from here. You know, it's going to be something unique, not available on our website that I'm going to send back to anybody that sends this town a book. And your book is going to be safe. It's going to be very safe. Let me put it that way in our library here. So if you want to swap a historic book for some surprise item from Cerro Gordo, there is a mailing address below. I'm going to open up some of these books on future videos and give a shout out to anybody that wants to participate. But if you want more people to enjoy your old books, please, please, please send them our way and uh, be on the lookout for a very cool library coming soon to Cerro Gordo. That's all I'm going to say, but the info is below and I hope you all participate and I hope you all have an amazing week and thank you, thank you, thank you as always.